أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبت يدا أبي لهب وتب ما أغنى عنه ماله وما كسب سيصلى نارا ذات لهب وامرأته حمالة الحطب في جيدها حبل من مسد رب شح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين Inshallah ta'ala, we're beginning our study of Surah Lahab. <coughs> this is Surah number 111 of the Qur'an. We're reaching the end of the Mus'haf. Three more surahs to go after this one. And Surah Lahab, as you all know, is one of the shortest surahs of the Qur'an and is dedicated to the historical accounts of one particular enemy of Islam, one particular kafir, Abu Lahab, and his wife. Uh, there are a few questions to be asked uh, that, are, that are of importance, Allah has not dedicated a particular surah to a particular enemy anywhere else. This is a very unique case in the Qur'an. There is no particular surah dedicated by name to Abu Jahl, or to, you know, to Akhnas ibn Shuraiq, or to you know, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, other enemies of Islam. There are no surahs dedicated to them in this way. So the question to be asked is why this special, you know, uh, special emphasis given to this particular enemy of Islam. That's one question we're going to try to answer. Other questions that we have to deal with as the dars goes on is uh, of course the placement of this surah. It comes after إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ in the Mus'haf and it is before Surah Al-Ikhlas قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ So the, we'll look at some benefits of where it is placed in the Mus'haf and how that uh, teaches us some lessons. But we begin inshaAllah ta'ala with some historical background before we get into the textual background today and the coherence of the surah. We'll deal with some things regarding the historical background of Abu Lahab himself, who is this man and who is his spouse. First thing is that this is one of the most famous people in Mecca, even before Islam. He's one of the most famous, wealthiest people in Mecca. By some accounts in Sirah traditions, he's also the treasurer. So he's uh, basically the treasure secretary, if you will, of that time. Very famous, politically powerful, also a young guy, and he's also good looking. His actual uh, original name is Abdul Uzza. But his nickname is Abu Lahab. And Abu Lahab, Lahab is actually a flame that flickers and gives off light. And it's red in texture. And this was a symbol of beauty to the Arabs. And they would call him Abu Lahab. Abu, by the way, doesn't literally mean father in Arabic necessarily. When someone is affiliated with something or associated to something, you can put Abu next to their name. Like Ali radiallahu anhu is lying on the dust and he's covered up in dust. So the messenger comes to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, Ya Aba Turab. Literally meaning the father of dust. But what does that mean? You're covered up in dust. Right? So... Similarly, you know, a, a famous Sahabi you may know, uh, probably you do know, by the name of Abu Huraira, because he had a cat and he loved it a lot, so he's just always with the cat, so he's called the father of cat. In other words, he doesn't really father the cat, but the idea is associated with the cat. Now, Abu Lahab is called, this, this nickname, he's given this name, is because he had a reddish complexion in his, in his skin, and he was considered exceptionally good looking, like a flame that sticks out in the night. So he was given this nickname because of his good looks. So on the one hand, you have to appreciate He's a very wealthy man, very politically powerful man, and he's also considered good-looking, kind of like a celebrity of our times, you know? That's, that's his status. Plus, his lineage is very powerful. You know, there are two main uh, big tribes. There's the Hashimi tribe, and there's the Umayyad tribe. And he is the grandson of Hashim. So he's actually got pretty high status. In terms of his family background also, and that's important to the Arabs, where you come from, what tribe you belong to, what background you have, that's also very important. Now who's the other person mentioned in this surah is his wife. His wife, whose original name is Urwa, she's actually the grandson of Umayyah. So he's the grandson of one of the great tribe leaders, Hashim, and she's the granddaughter, rather, of Umayyah. So she's also a high celebrity from her tribe. So these two high profile celebrities are married to each other. So this is like a power couple. Right? Both of them are very famous, 
very, very politically influential. She actually goes around and when somebody messes with her, she says, know that I am the daughter of the leader of the tribe. You know? So she, she flaunts the, you know, her, her status, her family background in people's face. And she actually did that with the messenger too, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Also, her nickname was Umm Jamil. Um Jamil. Now the word Jamil in Arabic means beautiful. Umm of course, mother. But just like father is not literally understood as father, the word mother is also not literally understood as mother. Umm Jamil was her nickname because she was known among the, among the city as being an exceptionally beautiful woman. So these people, these, this couple, the, the city, the people look up to them not only for their power and their status and their family nobility, but also for their good looks. This is, a, this is your class A celebrity couple, right? And they enjoy this status in society. Now, Abu Lahab happens to be a particularly vicious enemy of Islam. Particularly vicious enemy of Islam. And we're gonna study what makes him so vicious later on, but I'm gonna give you some, some hints of it for now. You know, it's one thing to be a mushrik, which is a high enough crime to end you in, lend you in hellfire. That's a bad enough crime. On top of that, to be a mushrik and a kafir, and to be an enemy of the Messenger wasallam, you're already in a hole, now you're digging it even deeper, right? But even to be an enemy of the Messenger wasallam, to, to, to go out of your way in hating, and, and, and being anim- showing animosity to the Messenger of Allah wasallam, nobody went as far as Abu Lahab, no one. There is no other enemy of Islam that goes as far as Abu Lahab. And we should learn some things about his character. You should know that he was the next door neighbor of the Prophet ﷺ. They shared a wall. And he knew when the... And you know, in ancient days, the wall, it's a wall, but there's no roof. So you could you know, throw stuff over into the other person's yard. So when, the, when he would know that the messenger is reciting Qur'an or praying, he would throw trash and dead animal skin and filth over to, the neighbors, to his neighbor to hurt him and cause him pain. And so the Messenger ﷺ would cry out sometimes in like, in desperation, this is the right of the neighbor you fulfill? I mean, even in the Arabs, there was some sense of chivalry and nobility and dignity that you don't do this to your neighbor. But he would even cross that line. Also, you should know that he's the uncle of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like direct relationship. Not only is he the uncle, he's also the father-in-law. Two of his sons are married to two of the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ. So he's got a lot of relationship, family ties to the Messenger of Allah. And by the way, when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam declared his his status as a messenger and he declared the the message of Islam, he had his sons divorce the daughters. And one of his sons, Utaybah, actually came to the Prophet sallallahu and spit towards him. He didn't reach the spit didn't reach the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but this was a symbol of great disrespect that you come to someone and you spit in front of them, you know, at, at, towards their feet. And this is what he had done after he divorced the, the, the daughter of the Messenger ﷺ. So when he did so, when his son spit like this, the Messenger of Allah had made dua against him. He had made dua against him. Now understand he's done two crimes, but one of them is, is not just against the dignity of the Messenger, he's hurt the family of the Messenger too, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So when he does so, the Messenger makes dua against him. And what ends up happening, and, and Abu Lahab heard of this dua and he got very paranoid that something's bad bad's gonna happen to his son. Now what does that tell you? It tells you that Abu Lahab, as much as he hates the Messenger, is still afraid of what? <laughs> his dua. So in, in, somewhere, somewhere down, deep down inside, he knows this, is, this man is speaking the truth. And Allah is on his side. Because who's gonna accept the dua? Allah Azza wa Jal is. Allah is gonna accept the dua. So what happens, they're traveling on a journey, and he put special guards around the tent of his son. Right? And he put horses outside and stuff, so there would be enough warning, because the dua specifically had to do with, oh Allah, get him, have him killed by one of your dogs, that you, a dog that you've created. Right? So he, the messenger made dua that he'd be killed by an animal. <laughs> a lion comes in the middle of the, the night, passes through other animals. Now when, you pass, when a lion passes through other animals, what do those animals do? They cry out, they make noise, they warn. No animal makes a sound, he makes it all the way into the tent and devours the son of Abu Lahab. So this is part of the fulfillment of the dua of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is a little bit of background, but even going further, you should know something else about Abu Lahab that we mentioned before. You know, the Messenger Wasallam lost a couple of sons early in their age. And one of them is Qasim radiallahu anhu. When the Messenger ﷺ loses Qasim, Abu Lahab hears the news 
And he comes out of his house screaming and dancing. And he goes to the majlis, the gathering of the leaders of Quraysh. And he says, Batara Muhammadun. You know the surah, Inna shani aka huwa al-abtar. Abtar. Batara means to have your lineage cut off. To have no one t- say your name after you. Because the only way your name would be repeated in the Arab tradition, in the Arab culture was, that you have sons that carry your name. Of course, the daughter goes to somebody else's family and ca- their ch- the children carry their name. So your name can only be carried by sons. So when the Messenger ﷺ loses his son, he goes and celebrates. Now think about this for a moment. First of all, all animosity aside, he's his uncle. This is the death of a child in his own family. Forget everything else. What kind of a disgusting human being would do that? And by the way, even when enemies fight each other, enemies are at each other's throats. When an enemy loses a child, you don't celebrate. You might even stop you know, the battle and say, you know, I feel for you. This is part of nobility in battle. Nobody celebrates the death of a child. That, you know, how despicable must you be? And to do that to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is like, you know, vicious upon vicious upon vicious upon vicious. It's layer after layer of animosity. This is something special. This kind of hatred is not shared, this is not shared by any other enemy of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this on top, like I mentioned, of the fact that he happens to be family. This is the last place you would expect this kind of in, in, you know, intense hatred. So this is why he's been given this special mention and a special punishment dedicated to him. When Allah Azza wa Jal mentions disbelievers will burn in the hellfire, he's included. But then Allah includes him especially, especially dedicating a surah to him shows you the special anger Allah has towards this wretched human being and his spouse. So, and, and we'll get to his spouse, you know, inshallah ta'ala, a little bit later on. So this is some background. And uh, going further in this background, I want to tell you that early on, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa when he was told to invite the people, he invites them to a dinner. He invites the, the leaders of Quraysh to a dinner. He feeds them, and as he's feeding them, he tries to introduce to them this message. But when, when he introduces this message, uh, you may have experience with dealing with rowdy guests. You know, he's giving them dinner and he's trying to talk to them. But well, what do they do? They make a lot of noise. You know, they, they make a lot of ruckus and they kind of disperse. They don't really listen. and They don't give the messenger a chance to speak sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, a little bit later on, the messenger alayhi wa sallam instructs Ali radiallahu anhu, who's a child at the time, to go invite the same leaders again for dinner another time. So this is the second invitation, right? At the second invitation, these leaders of Quraysh, they feel bad. Man, last time we didn't listen to him, we ate his food and we didn't listen to him. This time around, okay, we're eating his food, might as well give a chance to let him speak. So he speaks sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and gives them an invitation to this deen. And who speaks up? Abu Lahab. And he asks a question. He says, if I accept this religion, what do I get? What am I gonna get? So, he, the Messenger والسلام, informs him that you will have what everybody else has in this religion. You will be included among the believers and you will be in the paradise, you know, with the rest of the, etc., etc. And the Messenger explains this to him. And he says, الدين, This religion should be destroyed. I curse this religion. And why does he say that? I would curse the idea that me and these people, even the guys next to him, these other leaders of Quraysh, he said, me and these people, if they accept, we're going to be equal? <laughs> curse that religion. In other words, he thinks of himself as so high and so up there, he can't think of anybody else next to him. And this was enough for him to curse the religion that the Messenger was inviting him to, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is one incident. Then a little bit later on, the Messenger makes a public invitation. He rises, he, he climbs the mountain and he says, Wa sabaha. And this is a very important thing to, know, to understand and learn from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Arabs, they would go up the mountain and they would take all of their clothes off and they would scream, Wa sabaha, which means, oh, what a terrible morning is coming tomorrow. You know what that would mean? That would mean emergency. Now why would they take their clothes off? Maybe somebody can hear them screaming, but if you can't hear them screaming from farther away, what can you at least see? Guy's got his clothes off, must be an emergency. This was their way of declaring a state of emergency. This was their mass communication. Now, the Messenger ﷺ uses the exact same means of mass communication that were already there, but doesn't do what part? He doesn't do the shameless part. In other words, what we're learning is using mass communication is okay. 
but you remove from it what elements? The elements that are inappropriate, the elements that are shameless, the elements that are vulgar. You know, look at the parallels we have to that today. You have, you know, it started earlier on when mass communication was just being born with radio, then moved on to television, and now we have web and, you know, uh, all kinds of means of communication. And in all of these means of communication, there are elements of shamelessness. In every single one of them, there are very strong elements of shamelessness. But that in and of itself does not negate the value of these means of communication. The internet does not become evil because it's being used for evil. Because it can also be used for good. But our job is to separate the good from the evil. Our job is to, you know, to, to send the message of good without letting it mix with the evil. This we learn even from the strategy of the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. Anyhow, he invites them and he says, Wa sabaha. He invites them and you know, when the messenger invites them, he gives them, and you've heard the story many times, إِنَّ أَخْبَرْتُكُمْ أَنَّ بِسَفْحِ هَذَا الْجَبَلْ خَيْلًا لَكُمْ خَيْلًا كُنْتُمْ مُصَدِّقِيَّ If I told you that right behind this mountain there are battle horses waiting to attack, there's another tribe waiting to attack you, would you believe me? Would you accept what I'm saying to be true? They said, yes, of course, because we know you to be truthful. And this is how much they trusted the Messenger wasallam. That they would, he asked them, if I told you that, would you accept? Yes, I, yes we would. Then he makes open invitation to them as a messenger. And he gives them an invitation, you know, and he, and he tells, tells them, you know, لَتَمُوتُنَّ uh, كَمَا تَنَامُونَ You're gonna die just like you go to sleep every night. And you know, ثُمَّ لَتُبْعَثُنَّ كَمَا تَسْتَيْقِذُونَ You're gonna be raised again just like you wake up every morning. There is a resurrection. You know, and you will be judged for every one of your deeds. So the messenger delivers this profound monologue, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And of course, you know, we know this at, the, at this famous incident, Ali radiallahu anhu accepts. But what happens, you know, after that, Abu Lahab gets up and he says, "Tabbalak, Ali, hada jamaatana. We should curse you. Tabban meaning you should die a slow, painful death. And we'll come to the linguistic meaning a little bit later. He curses the messenger in this language, and he says, "You gathered us for this." You wasted my time for this, I thought there was a real emergency. The Messenger wasallam, is describing the Day of Judgment as a real emergency. <laughs> and you better get ready for it. When he describes the emergency of a, a battle, battle horses behind the mountain, that's a serious emergency to the kafir. But when he describes the Day of Judgment as an emergency, what are you talking about? That's a joke to them. You got, you're wasting my time with this stuff? Get out of here. And then, you know, this, when this surah came down, so the word tab has been used on multiple occasions by Abu Lahab now. Once cursing the religion itself, now cursing the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa And in response, there's two occasions when Allah responds, how many times does He use tab for Abu Lahab? Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab twice. The response is equal. The response is justified. And when this ayah came down, Abu Lahab would make fun of it. Because this guy was very sharp with his tongue too. And so was his wife. His wife was actually a poet. Right? She was a poetess and she used to make uh, a lot of sarcastic poetry. And she even made sarcastic poetry against the Messenger wasallam, after this surah was revealed. And we'll get to that, I'll share with you what she said. But before that, Abu Lahab used to go into public gatherings. And he used to take out his hands. Because Allah says, may his hands be destroyed, right? But yada Abi Lahabin, may both hands of Abu Lahab be destroyed. So this is the call Allah makes. So he used to take out his hands and stare at them in public and sarcastically say, Tabbal Lakuma, may you be destroyed. <laughs> he would do that and say, May you be destroyed. Then he says, Ma arafikuma shay'an. I don't see anything in my hands. I don't see anything in you two. You know, Mimma Yaqulu Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He didn't say we say sallallahu alayhi wa He says, from what Muhammad said, I don't see any signs of what he said. I don't see how my hands are being destroyed. And he would trash talk like this in public. Can you imagine? SubhanAllah, Allah has revealed him the worst warning, the, one of the scariest warnings in the Qur'an, that Allah would dedicate a surah directly to the worst enemy of the Messenger. You know, the extreme opposite of that is a surah dedicated to Allah's mercy to the Messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We studied this surah already, إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْثَرِ Surah Al-Kawthar is dedicated to Allah's mercy to the Messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the extreme opposite, the extreme opposite to him, and he takes it as a joke. That even gives you an idea of how much he deserves this. This kind of a curse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyhow, so he says, yada, Allah says, Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab. We have to explore the language a little bit more inshaAllah ta'ala. The word tab is, is a past tense verb. Tabba. And this is the feminine form, tabbat. The feminine is used because hands in Arabic are considered feminine. 
In Arabic, even nouns that we consider it in English, you know, in English there's a he and a she and an it. In Arabic, there's only he and she. Even an it is given a feminine or a masculine gender. Kind of like Spanish. And Spanish also because of the Arabic influence on Spanish. Nonetheless, not getting into the Arabic too much, but the feminine is used because body parts that are in twos, like eyes and ears and feet, right, and hands, these are considered feminine in the Arabic language. Body parts that are singular, like your head or your heart and things like that, they're considered masculine, but paired body parts are considered feminine. So eyes are feminine, ears are feminine, hands are feminine, feet are feminine, etc. That's why tabbat is used. Now, the past tense is used, which could be translated, both hands of Abu Lahab were destroyed. You could, or broke apart, right? They broke apart, because I'm translating past tense. But the Arab used past tense for several reasons. One of them is when something is guaranteed. Nothing is as guaranteed as the past. You know, the future is uncertain. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But I know for sure what happened yesterday. The past is associated with certainty. So when you talk about something that will happen in the future, but it's guaranteed. There's no doubt about it. It's, you know how we say in English, it's done deal. Right? It's done, even though we're done is past tense, right? When you talk about something that's done deal, you use the past tense. So Allah is basically saying, His both hands being destroyed is a... Done deal. It's done with. It's guaranteed that it will, they will be destroyed. That's one. The second is the past tense is used by the Arabs in ancient Arabic, even today actually, to refer to a dua, to a prayer. Which is why in some translations you'll find may both hands of Abu Lahab be destroyed. Now the word may, meaning in the form of a prayer or even a curse. Now you can pray for someone or you could pray against someone. You know in, in modern and even contemporary Muslim culture, maybe even if you don't know a lot of Arabic, you know a few Catch phrases. You know a few phrases. When somebody does something good for you, you say, Jazakallahu khairan. You heard that before? Jazakallahu khairan. Now it's commonly translated, May Allah reward you. But jaza is past tense. We don't say, Yajzikallahu khairan. We say, Jaza. Jaza is past tense. But it's understood in the form of a dua. Similarly, tabbat yada is Allah saying, May they be cursed. Meaning Allah is placing a curse upon him, guaranteeing it also. So tabbat yada abi lahabin. So now, the word tab, once again, I translated it as destroyed, but it literally means to break apart slowly or to collapse. To collapse. Other words used in the Qur'an that are similar are in fasama, in qadda, and taqatta. These are different words used for destruction or breaking apart or collapsing or, you know, falling apart. But tabab, this word specifically, tab, is used when something falls apart little by little, little by little, little by little, and it just keeps, keeps getting progressively worse and worse and worse until it's completely destroyed. That kind of destruction is called tabab. From it we get the verb tab. Meaning Allah is talking about Abu Lahab not dying an immediate death. He's talking about him dying a slow and painful and painful and painful death. Heading slowly and slowly and slowly towards a worse and worse death. You know like a car accident, immediate death? Right, or getting shot or speared in the back in the day on the battlefield, immediate death, that's halak. But tabab actually, tab was also used interesting, interestingly by the ancient Arabs in the following. They would go to a woman and say, a shabba am tabba. Shabba, are you a young woman? Am tabba, or are you being destroyed? They didn't say old woman, they said being destroyed because they affiliated old age with you deteriorating slowly and slowly and slowly towards your destruction. The poet says, Kuntu shabban fasirtu tabban. I used to be young and now I'm being destroyed. I'm breaking apart. He, he doesn't mean he's breaking apart. What does he mean? He's getting old. He's getting old. So this idea of the human body deteriorating and falling apart and the limbs don't function the way they used to and the back bends and the eyes don't work the same way anymore and the ears don't work the same way anymore and you can't run anymore and you can't climb anymore and your, your physical ability is just collapsing slowly and slowly and slowly heading towards your demise, this was also called tabab. And Allah uses that word as a curse against Abu Lahab but we still haven't understood why both of his hands. Now let's look at some classical commentary on the meaning of the word tab. Tabbat ay khasirat meaning to lose to diminish to suffer loss. What tabab huwa al-khusran al-mufdi ila al-halak. And it is a kind of loss that that goes progressively towards ultimate destruction that like we said. Now we're going to look at a couple of ayat of Quran. 
that are just absolutely amazing. There are two other ayat of Qur'an in which the a same word for destruction or deterioration or collapse is used from the same root as tab. One of them is, وَمَا ظَلَمْنَاهُمْ وَلَكِنْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فَمَا أَغْنَتْ عَنْهُمْ آلِهَتُهُمْ أَلَّتِي يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مِن شَيْءٍ لَمَّا جَاءَ أَمْرُ رَبِّكْ وَمَا زَادُوهُمْ غَيْرَ تَتْبِيب The word tatbib is from the same root as tab. Now let me tell you something about this ayah. Allah is talking about the mushrikun. And He says that we didn't wrong them. However, they wronged themselves. ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فَمَا أَغْنَتْ عَنْهُمْ Then their, their false gods, alihatuhum, they did not benefit them at all. Now I want you to remember that. Allah says in this ayah that their false gods did not benefit them at all. Is there any mention of benefit in this surah also? You know, in this, the ayah I just shared with you has tatbib, the same kind of destruction at the end. And Allah mentions false gods not being benefiting at all. And in this surah, surah Lahab, what do we find? Ma aghna, same word. Ma aghna anhu ma luhu wa ma kasab. His wealth did not benefit him at all. No matter, and also not anything that he earned. Now in two ayat where the same root is used, tab and tatbib, same root is used. And in those, both contexts, not coming to benefit is mentioned. But in one of them, what is not coming to benefit? False gods, aliha. In the other one, in Surah Lahab, what is not benefiting? Maluhu wa ma kasab, his wealth, or everything that he earned. So worldly, worldly acquisitions, assets, right? Now you tell me, which of these is more comprehensive? When you say somebody turned to their wealth for benefit, instead of turning to Allah, wealth is one false god. Wealth can be a false god, right? But the other ayah, where Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Alihatuhum. Now, aliha, false gods can include idols, it can include, you know, people believing in prophets to be the son of Allah, they can, they can include all kinds of false beliefs, right? So the word aliha is more comprehensive than just mal. Mal is only one kind of false god, but aliha is more comprehensive. Now, appreciate the precision and perfection of words in the Quran. Tabba in Arabic is the base form. It's, it's, you know, in Arabic you have base forms and you have powerful forms of a word. Tabba, the word that comes from it is tabab. Tabab, that's the, the base form. If you give it, if you give it, I, I, I want to use contemporary language, so I'll say if you give the word steroids, if you muscle it up and beef it up, then the word will become tatbib. Tabbaba. Instead of tabba, the ba will double up and become tabbaba. That's even worse. If tabba is bad, tabbaba is really bad. Tabbaba is really bad. Now, in Surah Lahab, Allah mentions one false god, which is Mal. Here in Surah Hud, Allah Azza wa mentions all false gods. So which ayah is talking about a worse scenario? The one in Surah Hud. And so at the end, the destruction is also worse. Allah says, Tatbib. وَمَا زَادُوهُمْ غَيْرَ تَتْبِيب. It didn't increase them in anything except the worst kind of destruction. Precision of language in the Qur'an. How tatbib is more powerful here because there's more than just mal involved. Is aliha, aliha are involved. Another place where this is, you know, very powerful in the Quran. How there are these intricate intertextual relationships. I said there are two other places where tab is used, right? There is ghayda, wa ma zaduhum ghayda tatbib, and then listen to this ayah. Wa ma kaidu fir'auna illa fi tabab. The planning of Fir'aun fell into nothing but slow and steady destruction. The planning of Fir'aun and landed him in slow and steady destruction. Even though this is not a lesson on Fir'aun, I should tell you something about what this ayah is saying. First, his plan to kill all the children in Egypt, every other year, all the boys. That's, that came to a fail because Musa is being raised in his own house. He is slowly raising his own death <laughs> in his house. In his house. When Musa salam comes back, he doesn't kill him. He challenges him. He challenges him and Musa alayhi salam defeats him in his court, in the palace, humiliates him in the palace, slowly re you know, reaching his own destruction. Then he gives him a few weeks. Eventually they will have a debate in the public sphere. Now inside the court it was embarrassing, but to bring it out in the public sphere, and then he forced all the people to come out. People were forced to come out and watch the final battle between Musa alayhi salam and the magicians. And people were being told, listen to the magicians, listen to the magicians. The magicians were trained, they collaborated with each other to try and defeat Musa alayhi salam. And the entire campaign was, listen to the magicians. Slowly he's building for what he thinks is his, his victory, but what he's actually building for is his own destruction. 
Everybody in the nation is, called, is told the heroes of this nation are the magicians. What happens to those magicians when they get the biggest stage of all? They take shahada and they tell the people on national television, if you will, آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ رَبِّ مُوسَى وَهَارُونَ We have come to believe in the master of all nations and all people and all generations, the master of Musa and Harun. They, Musa alayhi salam could not have found a larger audience to speak to. You know who gave him that stage and set up the conference for him and then gave, them the, gave him the main platform? Who did that for him? Fir'aun. He set the stage, his planning set the stage for his own destruction. Oh, slowly but surely headed in that direction. But I want to tell you something really incredible in this ayah. In this ayah, that Allah, is Surah Ghafir. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَصُدَّ عَنِ السَّبِيلِ And I'd like you to remember that until the end of this dars. The words are, وَصُدَّ عَنِ السَّبِيلِ what, You know what that means? He was kept from the right path. He was obstructed. Allah cursed him in a way that he was no longer able to come to the straight path. Now, this tabab, وَمَا كَيْدُ فِرْعَوْنَ إِلَّا فِي tabab. Same ayah at the end. One tab comes from for Abu Lahab. And the other tab is now coming for which individual? Fir'aun. And what does Allah say about Fir'aun? He was kept from coming to Islam. He was kept from coming to Islam. And I want you to remember that until the end of this dars, where we'll appreciate a miracle of Qur'an. A miracle of Qur'an in just this ayah. How Allah Azza wa Jal you know, uh, uh, gives us a challenge in his book that, you know, uh, uh, Abu, uh, Abi Bakr al-Baqillani rahimahullah spoke about in great detail. But we'll get to that towards the end. Now, we, deal, we dealt with uh, uh, Fir'aun and the parallel between Fir'aun and uh, Abu Lahab just now. But we're going to go further and look at some more linguistic meanings of the word tabbat before we go further. Ma'na tabbat halakat. One of the meanings of tabbat also to die violently. Qala maqatil khasirat. He also said to, to suffer loss. So now we're combining all of these meanings. Waqila khabat and to go bad and to go, you know, like food goes bad. You know, it, it gets sour and deteriorates, right? Um, and, and it gets like um, smelly. That's also khabat. You know, and so this, this is uh, one of the other meanings. Waqala ita dallat and to go to waste. Waqil safarat min kulli khair. Tabba also means to be completely void and devoid and emptied out from any good whatsoever. Waqasal yadain. Now this is important. And Allah specified both hands. Because Allah said, may both of his hands be destroyed. Bit tabab. Allah specified his both hands, attributing them to destruction. Li anna akthar al amali yakunu bihima. Because most actions are done with what? Hands. So what Allah is saying is everything he does is going to end up in destruction. Everything he does in life will bear him no good, will end him into destruction. وَقِيلَ murad bil yadain nafsuhu. And it's also said by saying both hands, it actually means as an Arabic figure of speech, it means himself. May he himself be destroyed. Every, he and everything he does, in other words. The figurative meaning would be, may he be destroyed slowly, and may everything he does be also put to waste, put to destruction. By the way, what does he do? He tries to destroy the mission of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That plan failed, and then he himself also is destroyed and we'll see how he comes to his death and how Allah fulfills this promise. وَقَدْ يُعَبَّرُ بِالْيَدْ عَنِ النَّفْسِ And like I said just now, it may be implied that by saying hands, you mean the person, and Allah does this himself when he says, بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ يَدَاكَ Because of what your hands sent forward. Allah speaks to the person on the Day of Judgment and says, this is because of what your hands sent forward. Meaning what you yourself sent forward. These are the deeds you did that you invested in, that you can reap the benefit from in the next life. So yada, bima qaddamat aydihim, bima qaddamat yadahu, bima qaddamat yadak. These are expressions used in the Qur'an for what a person does. So the two hands have that benefit. Now, other words, by the way, just as vocabulary, those of you that are into Qur'anic studies, other words that are used for flame or a flicker in the Qur'an, we said lahab, a beautiful red flame, right? Other words are shuwaaz and nuhas and marij and sharar. These are other words in the language that are used in the Qur'an to describe flames, but this is not the place for them. Now, another uh, implication of why both hands of Abu Lahab are mentioned, وَالْمَعْنَى هَلَكَتْ يَدَاهُ May his hands be destroyed, لِأَنَّهُ فِي مَا يَرْوِي Because it is narrated, أَخَذَ حجر حِجْرًا لِيَرْمِيَ بِهِ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. He grabbed a rock to hit the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. So his hands were committing an act against the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. So Allah cursed his hands. That's one of the narrations we find. This is commented on by Az-Zamakhshari in Al-Kashaf. Anyhow, 
Now, we, we come to this dhikrul yad. Again, one more commentary before we move further about the hands. Tabbat yadahu aydinuhu wa dunyahu ulahu wa uqbahu. One of the meanings of saying both, may both his hands be destroyed is his deen and his dunya. And the, the things he does beforehand, and the, things, the, the first things he does, and the outcomes of them. وَلِأَنَّ بِإِحْدَ الْيَدَيْنِ تَجَرُّ الْمَنْفَعَ وَبِالْأُخْرَى تَدْفَعُ الْمُضَرَّةِ أَوْ لِأَنَّ الْيُمْنَ سَلَاحْ وَالْأُخْرَى جُنَّةِ SubhanAllah The Arabs would say that your right hand is a weapon to attack. And your left hand is there to defend. Like you can imagine a warrior, right hand sword, left hand shield. And Allah says, may both hands be destroyed. What does that mean? One, he will not be able to attack. Two, he will not be able to defend. These are the meanings embedded inside, may both his hands be destroyed. Meaning, the, what good is a soldier in the battlefield if he has no capability for offense and no capability for defense? Both of them have been removed from him. Lima kannahu. Why did Allah give him a nickname? You know his original name is Abdul Uzza. And in Arabic literature, when you give somebody a kunya, when you give someone a nickname, it's considered an act of respect. It's considered an act of nobility to give somebody a title, other than the one they own. Now Abu Jahl was given that nickname as an, as an insult, because his original name was Abu Al-Hakam, <laughs> the father of wisdom. But because of his behavior, he ends up getting called the father of what? Ignorance, right? The super ignorant. But Abu Lahab is actually a complimentary it was a compliment to him because it expressed his good looks. You know, others even say he was called that because he had a hot temper, like a flame is heated, right? So his good looks and his hot temper. But nonetheless, this was sort of a compliment that was given to him. So the question is, how come the Quran uses a compliment to describe him? And there are meanings, benefits from it. The first benefit is, what's his real name? His real name is Abdul Uzza, the slave of Al Uzza. Al Uzza is a false god. Allah does not dignify him by mentioning the false god that he worships. Why should Allah Azza wa Jal mention his false god and call him his slave? Because he's not really his slave, that's a false idea. His name itself is a lie. Nobody is the slave of Uzza. That's not true, that doesn't exist. So the first benefit is not even acknowledging the false belief that he carries. The second benefit is, in لَمَّا كَانَ مِنْ أَهْلِ النَّارِ وَمَالُهُ إِلَى نَارِ ذَاتِ لَهَبْ You see, because he is from the people of fire, and Allah is going to put him in a flame that is also flickering red. Why not call him by his name? Because now his name has been given a new meaning. When, from now on, when he's called Abu Lahab, he's not called Abu Lahab because he's got reddish skin and he looks good, but it's because he's gonna be in a Lahab forever. So the meaning, the, the, the connotation of the nickname that's being used, Allah changed it forever subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how do we know He changed it forever? Sayasla naran. Now if you say sayasla naran, it's enough. He'll be thrown in a fire. But Allah didn't stop there. What did He say? Thata lahab. A fire that possesses a red flame. You like to be called by red flames, huh? You know what? You'll be known for it forever. <laughs> you know? This is Allah Azza wa Jal issuing sarcasm against this man. So anyway, tabbat yada abi lahabin watab. And so, you know, in Arabic, like I said, when you say abu something, you're affiliated with it. Abu shar sharir. You know, if you say the father of evil, that guy is just truly evil. Abu khair, the father of good, means a really good person. You know, bar. So, when Allah says abu lahab, it means this guy is all forever and always going to be known for a flickering hot red fire. Now, tabbat yada abi lahab, we talked about. But what's missing? Watab. There's watab at the end. Al awwal dua, wathani khabar. What does that mean? The first part is Allah issuing a curse against him. May his hands be destroyed. That's may it happen. Now, when you say may something happen, may you benefit, may you get better. No guarantee if it'll happen or not. When you say may, the next part watab, and he is he was in fact destroyed. It is as good as done. In other words, first Allah says may it happen. Then it's guaranteed. Watabba, and it will, it's bound to happen. Again, I mentioned how the past tense is a guarantee. So Allah has guaranteed that it's bound to occur. Remember how I used to make fun of it? Now let me tell you something about the character of Abu Lahab. This guy was scared to fight. You know, if Abu Jahl believes in the nobility of his tribe, he believes in the sanctity of Quraysh, he wants to fight the Messenger ﷺ because he thinks he's fighting for a higher cause, the dignity of the tribe. He's even willing to go out to Badr and fight. Abu Lahab doesn't go to Badr. Abu Lahab is too scared. 
You know what he does? He's a wealthy guy, so a lot of people owe him money. So there was this uh, mercenary, this warrior that owed him money. So he tells him, hey, you want to pay me back? Go fight for me. Go fight on my behalf. And the guy got killed too. <laughs> he wouldn't even fight himself. Not only is he a wretched enemy, he's also a coward on top of that. Now how does he come to his death? What is mentioned, what is narrated about him is, he developed a very serious disease. A very serious disease. Where he started developing these swellings all over his body. He started getting like these big, big bumps all over his body. And it was considered contagious. So his sons and his servants, family, everybody ran away from him because they were afraid of getting infected. So he's dying in pain slowly, slowly, and nobody's there to help him. He dies this vicious, vicious death with his skin popping and pus coming out. And his corpse is lying there and people are afraid to touch his corpse because they're afraid they'll get sick. So his sons finally hired some Abyssinians who got a bunch of logs of wood. They, they dug a ditch and they got a bunch of tall logs of wood and they pushed his corpse like this with a log of wood to throw him into the ditch. They wouldn't even touch it. Did Allah's words come to fruition? That he will, he will die a slow, painful death? Slow destruction? Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tabba. Subhanallah. Even in this dunya he suffered. Even in this dunya, Allah fulfilled His promise subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَالُهُ وَمَا كَسَبُ Neither, Allah says, his, his mal, his wealth, his assets, did not benefit him at all. At all. The word ma, I'm translating is not at all. Now, the word ma is important. It's, there are different kinds of negation in Arabic. You could say, لَمْ يُغْنِي لَمْ يُغْنِي عَنْهُ مَالُهُ but he says, ma aghna anhum. The, the word ma, one, it's strong, it's akad, it's more em emphatic. So not at all. That's how I translated it. The second benefit of ma is that it's always used to negate a countering idea. In other words, the Quraysh, and of course he himself believed, what's the biggest thing he has to his advantage? His wealth. And Allah refutes that idea and says, no, 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 no. And the word aghna here, even understand its guarantee of the future. Because when this surah was revealed, this hadn't happened yet. So even though it's commonly translated, his wealth and whatever he earned did not benefit him at all. What Allah is saying it is it will not benefit him at all. That's what he's actually saying. But he's saying it in a guaranteed form, so he's using the past tense. The guarantee of the future used in the past tense is part of balagha in Arabic, right? So now he's been openly told publicly, listen, you're gonna die a slow, painful death. It's guaranteed, and I don't care how much money you have. And on top of the money you have, whatever you want to earn on top, وَمَا كَسَبْ <laughs> Whatever you want to earn on top of that, none of it will come handy to you. And in Arab tradition, وَمَا كَسَبْ الْكَسَبْ يَشْمِلْ فِيهِ الْأَوْلَادِ You know, the kasab, the earning, what is included in it is your children. Your children are considered part of your earning. Your status comes from also how many sons you have who carry your name, right? So keeping that in mind, your money nor your children will come to any benefit for you. Not none whatsoever. مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَالُهُ وَمَا كَسَبُ By the way also, no I didn't mention this, I do talk about it here and there. There is the third person, you know, صِغَةُ uh, ghaib being used. Third, he, it didn't benefit him, not benefit you. Allah does not dignify him by addressing him. And this is the tradition of Allah against the worst kafir, right? He doesn't address them directly. وَلَا يُكَلِّمُهُمُ اللَّهِ لَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَلَا فِي يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Not in this dunya, not in the next. In, in the Qur'an, Allah says, وَلَا يُكَلِّمُهُمُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Allah will not address them on the day of resurrection. Now, the first thing was, مَالُهُ um, it's, it's implied, you know, because Allah mentioned two things. Not, not his wealth, not what he earned. But usually for us, what do we think? Your wealth and what you earn is one and the same thing. So why separate the two things? What's the benefit of that? There are several benefits. One of them is mal is something he already had because of his high noble lineage. <coughs> now if you have good money, you can invest it and make even more money, right? So maluhu, what he already had without putting any work in. And ma kasab, what he even worked for and acquired. Both of them combined still will have no benefit for him whatsoever. Now, Duhak, Rahmahullah, he narrates, مَا يَنْفَعُهُ مَالُهُ وَعَمَلُهُ الْخَبِيثِ يَعْنِي كَيْدُهُ فِي عَدَاوَةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. His, his wealth that was put, you know Allah said his hands were destroyed, but well, what were his hands being used for? His hands were being used to spend money against 
the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Not only was he not a beneficiary of his wealth, even the, his cause didn't benefit. The cause of trying to harm the mission of the Messenger did not come to any fruition, uh, regardless. The other thing that's mentioned is when Allah says, uh, you know, igna to benefit. Maybe he did do some good things. You know, some Quraysh sometimes they would give some charity, some sadaqa to keep a public face. And you know, when these people do such things, even if they do it to show off, or you know, like Allah says, Allah yura'un even in salah, right? But if they give to the people, even if they give to show off, in their heart they think, yeah, at least I did some good things. I'm not all bad. I do some good things. So even he thinks he earned some good deeds. So wa kasab even negates that. Whatever you think you earned, that's good. You got nothing. وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا We will come to everything they had done from any good that they think was good, and we'll turn it into nothing. When you don't have iman, don't think of good deeds. Good deeds come after you have iman. They have no value before if you negate iman, especially in, the, in face of a messenger that is right before you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, uh, moving forward inshaAllah ta'ala, this ayah, this ayah, وَمَا أَغْنَ عَنْهُ مَالُهُ وَمَا كَسَبْ We've heard similar lessons before. For example, يَحْسَبُ أَنَّ مَالَهُ أَخْلَدَ He assumes that his wealth is going to give him eternal life. Abu Lahab in particular took pride in two things, his wealth and his good looks. And Allah took two things away from him. No benefit from his wealth, and the disease he got was a disease of the skin. So what did he take away from him? His good, what he took pride in, his good looks, subhanAllah. And on the day of judgment, the person himself, the kafir himself cries out, مَا أَغْنِي عَنِّي مَالِيَ هَلَكَ عَنِّي سُلْطَانِيَ My wealth didn't come to any benefit for me. And all the authority I had destroyed me. Now Allah says, سَيَصْلَى نَارًا Very soon. See, this, the tense has switched. The tense has switched. Now the past tense was used to talk about the future. Sa is also used to talk about the future, but what's the difference? The immediate future is used with the past tense. Something that's gonna happen very, very soon. So soon you can even talk about it in the past tense. Meaning this is destruction in this world. But his destruction in the next world is not that soon. It's farther away when the day of judgment comes, when he's cast in the hellfire. But that day of judgment, as far as Allah is concerned, is not that far. إِنَّهُمْ يَرَوْنَهُ بَعِيدًا وَنَرَاهُ قريبا. They see it far away, but Allah says we see it very near. As far as we're concerned, it's very near. So Allah uses the word sa. Sa. When he says, Sa yasla, very soon he will be cast. He will come into contact with. He will be chucked into. Chucked into what? Naran, a flame. That alahabin, which has the pos- it possesses in it this, uh, has the quality of red flame and flicker in it. Now, and this is again sarcasm and wordplay in the Quran, specifically, specifically an attack against him. Attacking him and his pride. You, you like to be called by flames? That's what you're going to get exactly. As Mufassirun comment, the scene here is to issue him a threat and a warning that it's going to happen very, very soon. I asked you to remember one thing. I'm still gonna, not going to comment on it, but I will remind you what it was. I asked you to remember one thing. When Fir'aun was talked about, what did Allah say? He was kept from accepting the path. He was kept from Islam. When Tabab was mentioned for him. وَمَا كَيْدُ فِرْعَوْنَ إِلَّا فِي تباب في نفس الآية قال سبحانه وتعالى وصد عن السبيل لفرعون. He said about Fir'aun, he was kept from accepting the path. He was obstructed from it. That was a curse on Fir'aun that he could never come to iman. He could never come to it. He was prevented from it. Now keep that in mind until we reach the conclusion. By the way, what time is salat? Just nine thirty. Okay, so let's let's see if we can reach there in time, inshallah. Now we're turning to the misses. We're coming to, you know, Umm Jamil, her name is. Urwa, the original name is Urwa. And she again is from the lineage of uh, uh, Umayyah. And she is the sister of Abu Sufyan. She's related to Abu Sufyan. And she again comes from a very high noble lineage. Like I said, this was a powerhouse celebrity couple in Mecca. Both known for their good looks. Both known for their wealth and status. And she used to like to show off her status. You know how? She used to wear this really expensive necklace when she walked around town. And she liked to show it off. You know, really, really expensive jewelry with big diamonds and rubies and things like that? You keep them inside, you don't flaunt them. But she liked to do so. This was kind of their, their, their way of showing their superiority around town. Now, we're gonna read some, some background in regards to her. أَنَّهَا كَانَتْ لَهَا قَلَادَ فَاخِرَ مِنْ جَوْهَرَ فَقَالَتْ وَاللَّاتِ وَالْعُزَّةِ لَأُنْفِقَنَّهَا فِي عَدَاوَةِ مُحَمَّدٍ 
فأعقبها الله تعالى حبلا في جيدها من مسد النار سبحان الله she used to grab her necklace when she saw the messenger sallam and she used to say i swear by lat and uzza who are lat and uzza the false god that they worshiped i swear by these false gods she would say i will for sure i swear by it for sure for sure for sure spend this necklace to complete my animosity against muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam she would swear that she would spend even the most precious possession she has just to fulfill her her mission of animosity against the Rasulullah Rasul of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam Allah calls us in this ayah there are several things in this ayah that are remarkable first of all is the word imra'a imra'a al mutawalli al sha'rawi says something amazing about the word imra'a there are two words used for wife in the Quran there's the word imra'a and there's the word zawj there are two words imra'a and zawj now Sometimes Allah uses imra'a and sometimes Allah uses zawj. For example, when he talks to the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he says ya ayyuhan nabi qul li azwajik. Qul li azwajik. He uses the word zawj for the mother of mothers of the believers. Now, when he spoke to Adam alayhi salam, he said ya Adam uskun anta wa zawjuka al-jannah, zawjuk. Okay. So you might start thinking maybe zawj is used in good cases and imra'a is used in bad cases, but that's not the case. For example, Allah says Imra'at Fir'aun. Imra'at Fir'aun. The wife of Fir'aun. Who's Asiya radiallahu anha, who's a, one of the greatest women that ever lived. Well, what word is used for her? Imra'a. Zakariya alayhi salam. When he made dua to Allah, he said, Wa kanat imra'ati aqiran. My wife is not able to bear a child. What word did he use? Imra'a. So now we're finding sometimes zawj is used, sometimes imra'a is used. Now, you know this is not at a personal level but this is at a societal level what are the two benefits of marriage what are the two functions of marriage the number one function of marriage is to increase good in society and decrease corruption the purpose of marriage is to create more harmony two human beings come together in harmony two families come together in harmony and what does that do overall it brings human beings together in harmony the purpose of marriage is one of the main purposes of marriage is harmony the second purpose of marriage is this is the only legitimate means by which human beings can continue their species you can have children by illegitimate means or you can have them by legitimate means and the only legitimate means is marriage the two fundamental purposes of marriage are harmony and children these are the two legitimate children that is to say right these are the two fundamental purposes of marriage now a sha'rawi rahimahullah comments when any of these things what you know when any of these things is missing when any of these things is missing then allah uses the word imra'a when a child is missing or harmony is missing he uses what word imra'a and both of them are there he uses zawj for the mothers of the believers because they're called talk, talked about collectively allah uses azwaj Adam alayhi salam is in Jannah, there's no issue of children because you yourself have eternal life. So in Jannah, what do you say? Uskun anta wa zawjuk. There's no issue of children, there but harmony is, is there a hundred percent. Now one of the most interesting cases, by the way, Imra'at Fir'aun, what's missing? The wife of Fir'aun, what's missing? There's no harmony. Also there were no children. You know, that's why she loved getting who? Musa alayhi salam, right? So there, now, what about Zakariya alayhi salam? What's missing? There's harmony, absolutely. And actually even in the, in the case of Ibrahim alayhi salam, when the angel came and told him that he's gonna have a son, uh, Allah uses the word imra'a, dhahikat imra'atuhu, right? His wife laughed. Imra'a is not a bad word, it's, not a ba- it's a noble word, both of them. The word imra'a by itself means woman or mar'a, but when it's used as an idafa, the wife of, when you use an idafa, then it becomes wife. It's a noble term nonetheless. But we're trying to make a point about subtlety here. So what, words, what word was used for Zakariya alayhi salam's spouse? Radiallahu anha? Imra'a. وَكَانَتِ امْرَأَتِي عَاقِرًا But did she, Zakariya's spouse, did she eventually have a child? She eventually had a child, right? Now there's nothing missing. There's the child and there's harmony. So Allah says, وَوَاهَبْنَا لَهُ يَحْيَا وَأَصْلَحْنَا لَهُ زَوْجَهُ When he gave him Yahya, he said, we, we fixed for him, we reconciled for him, we bettered for him his zawj. So before the child, what word did he use? Imra'a, and after the child he used? Zawj. Now this is again, just to be clear, not to say that there's anything missing or anything uh, inappropriate about a couple who cannot have a child. Or they're, 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 somehow something is short or, or not as good or not as highly ranked, etc. But we're talking about the purpose of marriage overall. 
In the purpose of marriage overall, there's no denying it. These are the two reasons why we get married. There is, you know, there's no denying that. If, the, if, you know, if uh, human beings as, uh, as a whole do not have children, this species is extinct. And the only noble way of having children is by means of marriage. Okay, so now he, we use the word imra'ah here. So what's missing? They're, they have harmony, they have children, but you know, this is not the kind of harmony that's intended. <laughs> Two negatives don't make a positive. Right? That's what, what the case is here. So you have an evil wife, and a he evil husband, and they tag team very well with each other, but that's not what's meant by harmony. What's meant is an increase of good, not an increase of evil. These two coming together didn't increase good in society, what did it increase? Evil. There's the, so this is not really a case of the harmony that is intended. Anyhow, so uh, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمْرَأَتُهُ Now this is marfu. there's a dhamma on it, وَمْرَأَتُ the dhamma on it is important. This makes it a second fa'il. In other words, sayasla naran da talahab wa mra'atuhu. This is al fa'il al thani. In other words, he will be thrown into a fire that is made of flames, and so will his wife. It's a continuation grammatically of the sentence. Now, what's the benefit of that? The fire had a quality. What was the quality? Data lahab. And that quality is describing which person? Abu Lahab. But she is in sync with him. So she shares with him that same quality of flame. When she goes into the hellfire, they tag team in this dunya, so they get to tag team in the next life too. Subhanallah. Then Allah says, Hamala. Before I get to Hatab, Hamalata. There's a fatha on it. And this fatha, you know, the, this is called mansub in grammar. In, in Arabic grammar, they call this the nasub state, mansub. And in classical Arabic, there are 16 reasons why a word can have a fatha on it. One of those 16 reasons is a dham, a shatam, meaning condemnation, curse, anger. Allah is so angry at her, He doesn't say hamala tul hatab, He says hamala ta. Meaning, this is a way of Allah mentioning her with disgust. And the disgust is captured in the fatha. This is why, you know, a, a careful study of classical Arabic is so important. You overlook these kinds of lessons. You will read in translation the carrier of firewood. You completely miss what, what Allah is saying. The carrier, the way Allah is describing that carrier, carrying firewood, Allah is disgusted with her. And that disgust is manifest just in that fatha. Just in that fatha. Then there's the word hamala, not hamila. Hamila is fa'il, carrier. Hamala, ala al mubalagha, yadullu ala takrar, means the one who keeps on carrying and keeps on carrying and keeps on carrying. And by hamal and fa'al in Arabic, you, you refer to it when you refer to something that has a profession, like khabbaz. You know khubz? What's khubz? Bread. A baker is called khabbaz. It's his profession. Hammalat al hatab was actually used for slave women who used to carry firewood around. And they were actually in ancient Arabia, they were called hammalat al hatab. And Allah uses that, and you know, she thinks of herself as way up here. Way up here, way above that lower class of slave women that carry firewood. And what does Allah call her? وَمْرَأَتُهُ حَمَّالَةَ hatab. Allah insults her and degrades her with this word, with this phrase. And some ulama comment, حَمَّالَةَ hatab. This hatab is dry wood that is used to make fire. You know, and they don't have heating systems back in the day, right? You can't just turn the, th you know, the, the thermostat on at home. So how do you get heat in the home? You have to get firewood delivered. And these slave women would used to deliver it. Now he's calling her by that name saying, I have no respect for your status in society. I don't care who you are. When you mess with this messenger وسلم, you have no respect. You have no dignity. You have no status. So he calls her Hamalat al-Hatab. There are two additional benefits of Hamalat al-Hatab. So some ulama comment that that fire that is lahab, that is red, what is the fuel that will give it that flame? That, that redness is firewood. And one of her punishments in hellfire is she's, got, she's made to go carry firewood and bring it back and burn the very fire that she and her, husbands are, are rotting, her husband is rotting in. This is part of the, the punishment. That she gets to go and make her, pa her punishment herself worse. She is facilitating the fuel for her own fire. The third meaning of Hamalat al Hatab that is taken is as a figure of speech from, from you know, the study of Ilm al uh, uh, Bayan actually. And what, what it implies is that, you know, carrying firewood means 
that she used to take bad news from this one and take it to that one and spread a rumor from here and spread it there, causing a fire between people, giving them fuel for fire. So it's understood as a figure of speech so that this woman loves gossip and controversy and trash talk. And that's what... أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبت يدا أبي لهب وتب ما أغنى عنه ماله وما كسب سيصلى نارا ذات لهب وامرأته حمالة الحطب في جيدها حبل من مسد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ثم اما بعد We were making some concluding commentary about uh, Surah Lahab and we were up to the last ayah where Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in response to her uh, dedication to try to show animosity to the Messenger uh, صلى الله عليه وسلم that she would spend even the most precious necklace she has that she walks around with that she swears by Allah لا أنفقنه على عداوة محمد I swear I will spend it in, uh, in my animosity against, the, against Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but in addition to, to all of this filthy character that she had when this surah was revealed she came to the Prophet والسلام, and she said قد علم قريش أني بنت سيدها uh, قريش knows that I am the daughter of its leader so she comes angrily to the Messenger والسلام, looking for him. And from the, what the, how the narration goes, she, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Rasulullah were sitting and she was coming and it looked like she had a rock in her hand or something. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq told the Messenger والسلام, she's approaching and you could tell that she's angry. The Messenger والسلام, told Abu Bakr she's not going to be able to see me. Don't worry. And she came and she asked Abu Bakr, where is Muhammad? Where is he? Allah Azza wa Jal blinded her eyes from seeing him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when she came and she, you know, she was furious because the surah had come and it had humiliated her, you know, Hamalat al Hatab, and on top of that, Fijidiha Hablun bin Masad, you know, these are things that were very aggravating and humiliating to her. So she started making poetry against the Messenger himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before she left. And you know, the Messenger's name, Muhammad, comes from Hamd. Hamd. Hamd means someone, you know, Hamd is praise and gratitude. And so Muhammad is someone who is praised and someone who is thanked. This is Muhammad. The word them in Arabic, them, dal, mim, mim, double M you can say, right? Them in Arabic is condemnation. To condemn someone, to rebuke someone. She says, mudhammaman abayna. She didn't call him Muhammad, ma'adallah. She called him mudhammam. The one who is condemned, we have, or she says, mudhammaman qalayna. We are tired of him. She says, we're tired of him. We, we, we're done with him. Wadinuhu abayna, wadinahu abayna rather. And his religion, we have rejected. We've turned away from it. Wa hukmahu asayna, and his rule, we will always disobey. So she makes this poetry against the Messenger. When she, she, she barked what she had to bark and she left. And the Messenger was told what she said, and he, he was there too. He said she wasn't, he, she wasn't talking about me, she was talking about some guy named Mudammam. <laughs> right? And this is how the Messenger والسلام, we learn something here about uh, uh, sabr and about letting things roll off your back. When a dog is barking, there's no wisdom in barking back. Right? If a dog is barking at you and you say, how dare you, and you start roof roofing yourself, it shows how smart you are. So if she's going to run her mouth, there is no reason to dignify a response by saying, she's obviously not talking about me. And move on, let it brush off. Let it, let it move on. And you know, a lot of times, we don't learn this lesson. This is part of the seerah of the Messenger ﷺ. People say obnoxious things, especially on, you know, nowadays, you know, th there's a fitna today that didn't exist before. Before, people could say ridiculous things, absurd things, and they said them to their friend, they said them in a circle, and it died. Now they say them on a blog post. You know, now they post it on a, in, their comment, in the comment section on a YouTube video. And those filthy words and that stupid comment is not just there for a few seconds and it dies. Where is it? It's there forever and ever and ever. And people are writing their own ignorant responses to it. How dare you say this or that? It's like barking back at a dog. Just ignore it. Just ignore it. They, they want nothing more than your attention. 
You, you, you can't, you know, when people speak obnoxiously, when people speak ignorantly, the worst thing you can do is respond. The worst thing you can do, because that's all they want. They want your attention. That's what they live off of. They live off of conflict. You don't give them that, you, they don't get what they want. You know? And this is something Muslims, of all people, Muslims have to learn this. We have to learn this. We have to learn to be patient and recognize a bark for a bark. And an intellectual criticism for an intellectual criticism. When somebody actually has a genuine criticism to make, then we engage them in sophisticated, mute, you know, uh, uh, mature discussion. When clearly someone doesn't have the dignity to speak in you know, uh, a noble and respectful fashion, then there's no reason to come down to their level. You should already be smart enough to know it's not going to come to anything. You know? Anyhow, moving along. This uh, conclusion that Allah Azza wa Jal gives, fi hablu min masad, it leads us to some final commentary on this remarkable surah. You know, two themes are coming to a conclusion with Surat Lahab. Two themes. One theme has to do with Abu Lahab and the other theme has to do with Um Jamil or you know this Hamalat al Hatab, the title Allah gives her, right? What is the theme with Abu Lahab? You see, there are you could you could categorize it easily as four different kinds of disbelievers. Four kinds of disbelievers. There's a friendly disbeliever. Believe it or not, there's such a thing as a friendly kafir. Let me give you an example from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Mu'atam bin Adi. When the Prophet ﷺ was expelled from Mecca, he comes back under the protection of a man named Mu'atam, who took his six sons and surrounded the Messenger ﷺ with their swords taken out. He's a kafir, his, his sons are kafir too. But they had some respect for the Messenger ﷺ and they said, no, you can come under my protection. So he comes back to Mecca under the protection of a... Non-Muslim, this is a friendly kafir. Abu Talib is a friendly kafir. He supported the messenger. He protected the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Never took shahada. Not even at his deathbed. Not even at his deathbed. His pride got in the way. But nonetheless, he was friendly to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa There's one category. The second category is of a noble enemy. What I mean by a noble enemy is he does show animosity. But if he had become Muslim, he would have been an amazing Muslim. Because when he fights, when, you know, there are also, even in our time, there are noble enemies. They believe in their nation, they believe in some higher ideal. It's not about their personal agenda. They believe in some ideology. That ideology could be false. We're not denying that. But they believe in it and they're true to it. And they're willing to fight and die for it. An example of that is one of the worst enemies of Islam, actually, Abu Jahl. And now why do I say Abu Jahl is a noble enemy? He has so much potential for good that when the Prophet ﷺ makes dua for someone to come to Islam, who does he mention by name? Either Umar bin Khattab or Umar bin Hisham, which is Abu Jahl. The Messenger sees potential in him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. On top of that, Allah sees potential in him. We find Araita in kana ala al-huda, aw amar taqwa Didn't you see? If he, referring to Abu Jahl, if he had been committed to guidance. And if he would command to taqwa. In other words, now by the way, being committed to guidance and commanding to taqwa is the legacy of Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. That's his legacy. Allah is showing that potential in who? Abu Jahl. But he has the other side too. Right? And, you know, and so he took, the other, he took the other road. One Umar takes the right road, the Umar takes the wrong road. But the potential was there. Potential was there. This is the second enemy. The third kind of enemy doesn't live for a higher ideal, doesn't have any noble characteristics. But he doesn't have anything personal against the messenger either. It's just his greed, his own agenda, his own you know, political savvy or reputation that he's trying to protect. And to show that reputation, he's showing animosity to the messenger, but nothing personal. Nothing personal. Utba ibn Rabi'a, you know, the great debater, the great debater. Walid ibn Mughira, there's a poet. And he wants to show that he's such a high-end poet, nobody can top him in poetry. So when he hears the Qur'an, he's standing there making faces. Mm, how, do I, how do I respond to this? You know, when, they, when he, came, he comes back listening to Qur'an, they asked him, so what do you say? Is this, uh, is this poetry or what? He goes, no, it's not poetry. Can't call it poetry because that'll invalidate our propaganda. Clearly this is beyond poetry. So what should we say? Is this like a soothsayer? One of those people that just you know, spew out nonsense. He goes, no, soothsayers say nonsense. This isn't nonsense. This is actually pretty beautiful. And it's got a lot of sweetness in it. Fihi halawa. It's got sweetness in it. And then he, they say, so what should we say? And he says, let me think about it. You know what? Call it magic. 
call it magic that causes separation between father and son, husband and wife, tribe and the people, the, the person and their tribe, call it that. That's, you know, that's what you should label it. By the way, before we even go on, magic is not something you hear. Magic is something you see. The Quran was not seen, the Quran was what? It was heard. The fact that the, their biggest enemy is, able, is willing to call it, by the way, magic is also believing in something that doesn't make sense from, you know, for, before your eyes, it has to be something in the unseen, some leap of faith when you call something magic, right? They're willing to take a leap of faith, which shows you that even the kafir acknowledged the miraculous power of the Quran. By calling it magic alone, you, it shows that they couldn't explain it through common sense. This is something beyond. We're not, we're not willing to accept it from God, so the very next, a leap of faith underneath that is what? Magic. It's still a leap of faith though. It's still an acknowledgement of the power of the Qur'an. They haven't even seen it, they've heard it, but it's mystifying what they hear. They're mesmerized by what they hear. And they le they're left stunned, so they can't come up with any other description than magic. So, but this is your third degree of enemy. So you've got the friendly kafir, you've got the noble enemy, you've got the wretched enemy, but nothing personal. What's the worst of the worst? The worst of the worst is the one who hates Islam. May this religion be cursed. Her, hates the religion, then he says, Tabalak alihada jama'atana, may you be cursed, did you call us for this? This is Abu Lahab. The worst of the worst of the worst. And I started this dars with this. Why is he mentioned specifically a surah dedicated to one enemy? There are so many enemies of the Prophet ﷺ, no surahs for them. No, none of them called by name, not Abu Jahl, not Utbah, not, not anybody else called by name. Why dedicate a specific surah to him? He is the worst of the worst. Close family, Horrible neighbor, his wife is at it, you know, throwing thorns on the path of the messengers, you know, walk out of the house. He's throwing filth into the house. He's attacking the messenger, sallallahu He's the first to insult him publicly, the first, historically, to insult the messenger publicly. His own uncle, Abu Lahab, right? He's the first in many things. He's the first to celebrate the death of, of the passing of his child, Qasim radiallahu anhu, the first in that too. The first in cursing the messenger, sallallahu He's the worst of the worst. So he is the climax of the enemies of the Messenger in the Qur'an. Now what's the other climax? Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about four scenarios. It's very easy and beautiful to understand. There are four scenarios for women. So we're talking about the man now, Abu Lahab. What's, who's the woman we're talking about? Um Jamil, Arwa, right? We're talking about her now. There are four domestic situations for women. You could have, and I'll put it very simply. You could have a wonderful woman with a wonderful wali, a wonderful woman under the, under the responsibility in a, in, a very, in a wonderful household, if you will. That example in the Quran is that of Maryam, salamu alayha. Whose uh, uh, responsibility is she? Zakariya alayhi salam, wa kaffalaha Zakariya. So that's one situation. A wonderful lady, wonderful guardian. That's one scenario. What about you have a wonderful woman, but a terrible guardian? Is that situation also mentioned in the Quran? It's also mentioned, Imra'at Fir'aun. Imra'at Fir'aun. The wife of Fir'aun. One of the best women that ever lived. One of the most righteous people that ever lived, but in a terrible domestic situation. So you've got the best and best, then you've got the best woman in the worst situation. What about, you have a terrible woman, but she's got a great domestic situation. She's got a wonderful wali. What about Imra'at Nuhin wa Imra'ata Lut? What do you find in those cases? These women are wretched. فَخَانَتَهُمَا Right? فَخَانَتَهُمَا They both were, they, they were, uh, uh, they violated the trust of their husbands. Who? Nuh and Lut alayhim as -salam. And their husbands are the, some of the best people that ever lived. These are prophets, messengers. Right? So you've got the opposite scenario. Now we've got three situations. We've got best of both worlds. We've got a great woman in a terrible, terrible husband. You've got Terrible woman, great husband, what's left? Terrible woman, terrible husband, that comes to an end in Surah Lahab. We come to the climax, worst of the worst. <laughs> Tag team. Like I said before, two negatives don't make a positive. So that theme that is running in the Quran comes to a conclusion here in Surah Lahab. These two recurring themes, the worst enemy and the worst woman. The worst male enemy and the worst female enemy and the worst kind of female character comes to their climax, both of them in Surah Lahab. Now in concluding commentary, some things about the placement of this surah. 
Very interestingly, in the previous surah, Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned that which will benefit you in the next life. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ Tasbih of Allah, hamd of Allah, istighfar to Allah. Where will that really have benefit for you? It has some benefit in this life. Where is the real benefit of it? In the next life. In this surah, Allah tells us what will have absolutely no benefit in the next life. مَا أَغْنَ عَنْهُ مَالُهُ وَمَا كَسَبْ No benefit in the next life. So there's a contrast between the two. Then we find, you know, Allah says, زُيِّنَ لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا وَيَسْخَرُونَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا he says in Surah Al-Baqarah, for disbelievers, worldly life was beautified. And as a result, they make fun of those who believe. For this worldly life was beautified for kuffar, and they make fun of those who believe. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ فَوْقَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ And people who have taqwa will be above them, not in this world, but Allah says, on the day of resurrection. But in this case, Allah gave His Messenger a sec, a, a, an additional gift. Not only will, be, will he be above Abu Lahab in the Akhirah, but also above him in this dunya. He dies this terrible death. In the, he has that suffering in the Akhirah, but also gets the worst, nastiest death in this dunya. So this is a victory granted to the Messenger Wasallam, And this is consistent with Allah's promise when he says, كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَا أَغْلِبَنَّ أَنَا وَرُسُولِي Allah has declared, I will dominate, I and my messengers. I will overcome. And غَلَبَ in the Qur'an, like غُلِبَتِ الرُّومِ, right? This word is used for victory in this world. Aflaha, falah, iflah. This is used for victory and success in the next world. But you know, uh, for example, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Ghulibatil Rome." Rome was dominated. Dominated when? This world, right? So the, the word "ghalaba" is different from the word "aflaha" to succeed or overcome. Also, anyhow, the final comment, and this is where I, where, where we're concluding, and this is where I want you to remember. When Fir'aun was compared with Abu Lahab, how was he compared? The word tab occurs for Abu Lahab, and وَمَا كَيْدُ فِرْعَوْنَ إِلَّا فِي tabab. Right? Tabab is used for Fir'aun also. So there's a kind of comparison between Abu Lahab and Fir'aun. But what, what did I ask you to remember about Fir'aun? وَصُدَّ عَنِ sabil. In that same ayah where tabab is mentioned for Fir'aun, Allah says, وَصُدَّ عَنِ sabil. What does it mean? He was kept from accepting the deen, accepting the path. Now, here, Abu Bakr al-Baqillani wrote in the 3rd century, he wrote a book called I'jaz al-Qur'an, The Miracle of the Qur'an. And it's, you know, when I read that book, I was really sad, the first page. The first page of that book is very, very sad. He talks about how the miracle of this book, the scholars have given up on it, the Muslims don't appreciate it, they don't value this book for what it is, and we have come to the end of times. He's talking like this in the 3rd century. <laughs> Wait till he sees 2010, huh? SubhanAllah. <laughs> You know, and he's that depressed in the third century of Islam. But anyway, he talks about reviving the idea of what makes the Quran miraculous. He talks about its miraculous language. But one of the things he says, he argues one of his chapters, is part of the miracle of the Quran are the predictions of the Quran. The predictions of the Quran. The Quran made a call. The call was Rome will dominate within 10 years. Within 10 years, they're going to make a comeback. They were dominated now, within 10 years, they'll come back against the Persians. The Quraysh heard that and said, come on. There's no way, they were crushed and annihilated within 10 years. And this, did it come true? Absolutely. This was a prediction, rather a promise made in the Qur'an. Now, another promise made in the Qur'an, Abu Lahab will be destroyed. And if you didn't already realize, Abu Lahab is one of the sharpest tongues, one of the cleverest enemies against the Prophet ﷺ. One of the easiest ways, easiest ways, the Qur'an made itself open to attack. Abu Lahab could turn around and say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa If he just says that, even if he says it sarcastically, you know what he could do? He could say, look, your book says I'm being destroyed, I'm burning in hell, but here I am taking what? Shahada? The shahada is supposed to do what? Protect me from the hellfire. So I guess your book is wrong. He could do that. He has years to take this opportunity to attack the messenger in this way. But the Qur'an said about Fir'aun, وَصُدَّ عَنِ sabil. He was kept from the path. Fir'aun was kept from the path. And he landed himself in tabab. And tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab. And what did we do? Miraculously, what did we find in the Qur'an? He's making sarcastic commentary about his hands, saying, hey, my hands still are here. You know? لَكُمَا May you be destroyed. I don't see anything that Muhammad talked about. 
That's what he would say publicly. He would make sarcastic commentary. Never once did he take the opportunity to do what? Take shahada. It was open to attack. He never did it. He never did it. And we learn from that, وَصُدَّ عَنِ sabil was fulfilled on him too. He was kept from accepting the path. He was kept from it, fulfilling the promise of Allah Azza wa Jal. Fulfilling that promise. This is part of the miracle of Qur'an. When Allah makes a promise and it's guaranteed, it is bound to occur. إِنَّمَا تُوْعَدُونَ لَوَاقِرْ Whatever you have been promised is guaranteed to occur, no doubts about it. Our final comment is about the placement of this surah. This surah comes, there was Surah Al-Kafirun, then there was إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ And now there is تَبَّدْ يَدَى أَبِي لَهَبٍ وَتَمْ Surah Al-Kafirun concluded that there are two distinct religions. لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ There are two distinct religions. There's the deen of Islam and there's whatever you people have. Now, one of them is true and one of them is false. One deen is true, one deen is al-haqq. The other one is false, al-baqil. In Surah Al-Isra, in Surah number 17, Allah Azza wa Jal says, جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ he says the truth will manifest the truth will manifest and the falsehood will dissipate the falsehood will be destroyed so now Allah makes first of all in Surah Al-Kafir we learn there are two deens deenukum waliyad-deen now we're learning one deen is haqq and the other deen is batil and what did Allah say about haqq it will come it will arrive and what will happen to batil it will be destroyed now listen إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ إِذْ جَاءَ الْحَقْ that surah, Surah Nasr, is Allah pro- fulfilling the promise of Ja al Haq. What is Surah Lahab? Wa Zahaq al Batil. Falsehood being destroyed. Falsehood coming to an end. That promise Allah made in Surah Al Isra in two statements, Ja al Haq wa Zahaq al Batil, is being fulfilled at the end of Quran. Ida Ja Nasrullah is a manifestation of Ja al Haq, the truth coming. And the second, the falsehood being dissipated, Wa Zahaq al Batil, this is Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab bin Watab. SubhanAllah. How Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, uh, oh my teacher, Rahimahullah, one of my great teachers, Dr. Isa Ahmed, used to describe, Allah plants a seed somewhere and shows the flower blooming somewhere else. And this happens all over the Quran. He plants the seed, so something small he'll say. And then it comes in full bloom somewhere else. We learned that before in this series, when Ibrahim alayhi salam made a dua, he said, رَبِّ جَعَلْ هَذَا بَلَدًا آمِنًا وَارْزُقْ أَهْلَهُ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ Make this a peaceful city, provide its children all kinds of fruit. And that, that seed, turned into a flower where? Two flowers where? At the end of Qur'an. So you find Surah Al-Fil about the peace of this city. And you find, you know, the, the next surah, Allah Azza wa Jalla talks Surah Quraysh about what? The fruits of this city, the, what, how they get to enjoy fruits. So something small is said someplace, and it manifests in full bloom in another place. May Allah Azza wa Jalla give us an appreciation of the remarkable beauty of the Qur'an. May Allah make us of those who recite it properly day and night and understand it. May Allah make us of those who fulfill this wonderful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu He says, I'd like to conclude with it, Ya Ahlul Qur'an, people of Qur'an, La tatawassadu al-Qur'an, don't relax with the Qur'an. Don't be lackadaisical about the Qur'an. Tatawassadu actually literally means don't turn it into a pillow. Don't lean on it. Watluhu haqqa tilawatihi min ana'il layli wa nahar Read it like it deserves to be read. Follow it like it deserves to be followed in all hours of the night and day. Wafshuhu and spread it. Wataghannuhu and beautify it. Watadabbaru fihi and reflect deeply in it. La'allakum tuflihun so that all of you may succeed. Allahumma ja'alna min al-muflihin. May Allah make us from those who succeed. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi al-Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ni wa iyyakum bil-ayat al-Hakim. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. عرفتني؟ أنا حبيبك أباليسو عايش معاك يا ولد آدم آكل شارب نايم وأنت ما تداري عن شيء فاكر؟ فاكر يوم ضحكت عليك وانطرت من الجنة من يومها وربك بيحذرك مني وبينبهك وأنت ساذج تسمع كلامي أنا إذا كان تحب بتصيلي إذا كان تكرهني تسمع كلامي أنا ليه بعد ذا كله تبغى ترجع الجنة ها
أنا عندي خبرة آلاف السنين في تغريرك وهوايتك في الضحك عليك وأنت طول عمرك أبلى أنت طينة وحتفضل طول عمرك طين أمشيك على كيفي مع إني ما أقدر أسوي لك شيء يا دوب أوسوسلك بكلمتين وأنت تسمع كلامي وتنفذ على طول أنا عارف إني لو قلت لك روح أعبد صنم راح تعصيني راح تسوي لي فيها متدين ومخلص لربك لكنك أكبر كذاب يا ولد آدم تنكر؟ تنكر إني خليتك تعبد كل شيء حوالينك خليتك تعبد نفسك وكبريائك خليتك تعبد الفلوس والجنس والمظاهر خليتك تعبد كل شيء تافه إذا كان خليتك تعبد هذه نار لهب قطران مرض قرف قطعة مني خليتك تعبدها عشان خاطري أنا تقوي لك شخصيتك ها تعدل مزاجك ما فيش آية في القرآن تقول حرمنا عليهم التبغى والدخان شفت أنت اللي بتضحك على نفسك يا ولد آدم مش أنا اللي بضحك عليك أنا بس بشجعك على غباك أنا راح أحرقك زي ما تحرقها أنا راح أدوسك تب ترجع الجنة على جثتي أنا تلعنت وانت لازم تلحقني يا ولد آدم وأنا وراك والزمن طويل يا ولد آدم إن الشيطان لكم عدو فاتخذوه عدوا